Well, hello. I'm Rob D. Hart, curator at Tudor Place, and it's so great to have you guys here today. I'm really excited about the program because I first came familiar with In Flanders Fields Museum back in 2000. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, the mic's just for our live stream, so but I'll, but I'll talk louder. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I first became familiar with it when I was in grad school. Uh, I went over to Belgium with my wife and we went to In Flanders Fields Museum and I was so impressed. It was one of the best museums I'd ever seen up to that point. And what I loved about it was its mixing of technology and material culture. I thought was one of the best presentations I had seen. And also for a war museum, it was really a museum about peace. It focused on the experiences of all sides of the soldiers in the war is multilingual uh it was diverse it was inclusive there were so many things i loved about that museum so when it was time for me to do an internship i called in flanders fields in belgium and see if they would take an intern and they were nice enough to take me as their first international intern in 20 or 2000 2001 uh, and it was a great time. I learned so much being there, learned so much from Dominique. So I'm real excited that they were able to come here to DC and they've been like killing it here. They've gone to Gettysburg, the National Archives, Library of Congress. They've been every place, they've been fantastic. So it's been so wonderful to host them and um, go see them if you have never been to Ipia. It's, it's beautiful, the cloth hall and the museum's wonderful. So I'm really excited about tonight's um, presentation. So without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce, are you guys both coming up or just one at a time? Okay, which one's first? Okay, okay, so uh, the, from In Flanders Fields Museum from Belgium, it's uh, Dominique Dinovin and Peter Trof. Please welcome them. Thank you, Rob. Um, indeed, um, my name is Dominic, Dominic den Doven, and indeed Rob was our first international intern, and there were many to follow because um, the museum we are working for has been in existence since 1998, which is not that long. Um, just some images to give you an idea. I won't talk too much uh, on uh, the museum. It's quite, this is the second version we've uh, realized in 2012. Um, you know, something on the basic principles of the museum, um, Rob already explained some things, uh, but basically it is a local museum. And what I mean with local is that um, it has a global subject and a global reach, uh, because it's telling about the First World War in Belgium, and we had people from 125 contemporary states, UN member states, present in Belgium, during the First World War, so it's all about them, but still we're focusing on what happened in our area in Belgium, in our little corner of the country. Um, secondly, um, it's rather a museum about war experience than about the war itself. Of course, the facts and the figures are there, but we're focusing on how it was to live through that war and how it was to experience that war from different perspectives. Um, from all sides, all belligerents, uh, but also from all, all genders, men and women, uh, but also from status, uh, civilians, military, nurses, um, and so on. And another aspect that has um, entered our scope uh, in the last 15 years is that we're also looking at the landscape, um, because that generation who went through the First World War in the last 20 years, quickly uh, passed away. Um, I mean, we've known them, these people. The idea behind the museum was also to pass their stories on to the next generation. But we've also realized that while that generation, the personal witnesses have gone, um, everything is still there in the landscape. And you've got something like conflict archaeology um, that came up in the last 20 years. Um, well, basically, it is such. If you dig wherever you are in our area and you dig after half a meter, which is two feet, you will encounter the First World War in one way or another. Uh, either it's a trench that was one day in your garden, or uh, in my case, I live in the center of the town, um, and you dig, and after 
uh, at a certain moment, uh, you're altering your house, you dig, and at a certain moment, you encounter a black layer where the house burned down in 1914 or 1915. So wherever you are, um, the war is still there. Even in um, the landscape, the urban landscape of the town, um, this is our home. This is the building hosting the museum, uh, the famous cloth hall of Ypres. Um, it was originally the biggest Gothic building in the world, which was not a church. Um, it has roughly, it dates from the 13th century, originally it dates from the 13th century. Um, it has roughly the same dimensions as the Notre Dame in Paris. Um, and it combined the functions of a market hall, um, most of the building, the town hall, and then the traditional Flemish belfry tower, uh, in which you have the carillion, but also in which the treasury and the records of the town uh, were kept. Um, however, this is how the place looked in 1917, the year the US entered, uh, officially entered the First World War. Uh, this is our office. Building looked like in 1917, and this is with still a year and a half of bombardments and fighting to follow. So the destruction will be um, even worse. So the building you have today is actually a fateful reconstruction. The reconstruction was finished in 1967 only. Uh, so it would took a long while, and we are the museum is basically housed on the first floor. Um, our offices are on the back sides. Um, you've got a museum cafe and all the, the odd cons um, you expect to be in a museum. And this is how the whole place looked in 1919. Um, well, it's something that some people uh, rather compare with Hiroshima in August 1945. So the town was actually basically, well, not basically, was officially 100% destroyed. So everything you see, uh, today has been reconstructed from 1921 onwards. Um, it was not only 100% destroyed, it had no inhabitants anymore. So those who had not fled were evacuated by uh, 1915. Yeah. Um, so that's something on the place we're coming from, but that's actually not the subject of today's talk. Uh, we're going to talk on the Americans who were present in Belgium during the First World War. Um, in Belgium, but we've used the term in Flanders Fields. Um, that's the name of our museum. It's also the name of uh, the most famous poem of the First World War, which gave uh, birth to the poppy as a symbol of remembrance. Um, and it's uh, also a kind of um, a way of saying that we're talking about the presence of Americans in the battlefields of Flanders during the First World War. Um, several parts, I'll uh, start on the American non-military presence in Belgium before the American entry in the First World War. Um, then there will be something on American military presence uh, before the uh, Amer US entry in the First World War, something on the American Expeditionary Force, and then something on the aftermath. Yeah. Um, so starting with the American non-military presence in Belgium, well, the war started 4 of August 1914, when the German Empire invaded uh, neutral Belgium, and um, that was also the official beginning of the First World War, because the invasion of neutral Belgium was uh, the, what they call in Latin cases, belly, uh, the reason for going to war for the British Empire, and with the British Empire, uh, nearly one third of the world. And that brutal invasion of a neutral country, of a small uh, country which hadn't been in war for nearly 100 years, um, actually yeah, sent shockwaves throughout the world. And you can actually compare it to what we have seen happening with the Ukraine lately, although the Ukraine is much bigger than Belgium um, ever was. So just for you, those who are less familiar, uh, the position of Belgium, which was a country of 7.5 million, uh, very densely populated. Um, at that stage, 1914, one of the richest countries in the world, I think it was the fourth richest country, uh, one of the most, after England, the most industrialized country, 
uh, of Belgium. What happened in 1914 is that in August 1914, the Germans invaded the country in order to attack France and Paris from the north. And uh, in August, September, October, they moved on until the front line got to a standstill here in the far west of the country. So the front line from here to there, that's about 40 miles, and Ypres uh, is to the south of this small uh, bit. The first Amer American I would like to mention was one of the handful of journalists who were present in Belgium at the beginning of the First World War. Um, e. Alexander Paul, um, he was a New York war correspondent. He worked for New York World Daily, the New York World, the Daily Mail, and several other newspapers. And the, in the early months of the war, he traveled through Belgium together with a Kansas-born war photographer named Donald Thompson. Uh, later on in 1917, he would join the American Expeditionary Force. Um, but he was very important in informing the American public of the nature of the German invasion and the many atrocities committed by German troops in Belgium. And his book, which you see here, published in 1915, uh, during the centenary, translated into Dutch or mother tongue, it still makes a very good read. And in the introduction of the book, he declares, and I'll use many quotes of Americans' presence in Flanders then, he declares, I quote, an American, I went to Belgium at the beginning of the war with an open mind. I had few, if any, prejudices. I knew the English, the French, the Belgians, the Germans equally well. I had friends in all four countries and many happy recollections of days I had spent in each. When I left Antwerp after the German occupation, I was as pro-Belgium as though I had been born under the red, black and yellow banner, the Belgian flag. I had seen a country, one of the loveliest and most peaceable in Europe, invaded by a ruthless and brutal soldiery. Um, Paul stayed in a hotel in Antwerp, and he's one of the witnesses on 25th August 1915 of the first aerial bombardment um, in world history by a Zeppelin uh, of a civilian target. Um, he was also the first foreigner to enter certain cities that were set on fire, put on fire by the invading uh, Germans. Uh, for instance, the medieval university town of Louvain, uh, and I get to Leuven, Leuven later. Um, and he described the ransacking of Leuven in words that were adapted to his American readership. Um, I quote: "In comparison to its size, the Germans had wrought more widespread destruction in Leuven than did the earthquake and fire combined in San Francisco in 1914." So, the uh, the memory of the earthquake of San Francisco was still. Uh, looming largely uh, in the States. He was also among the first to draw attention to the misery that befell the Belgian population, that there was a grave danger of starvation, because Belgium, as one of the world's most industrialized countries, was a net importer of food. Uh, it had been since, since the mid-19th century, it was dependent on the import of food to feed its, public, uh, its, um, its uh, inhabitants. Uh, but he also testifies how the Stars and Stripes had a, a capacity to inspire hope in the population of the occupied or soon-to-be-occupied regions of Belgium. And again, um, a final quote uh, he wrote, the distance from Leuven, Louvain to Brussels is in the neighborhood of 20 miles, and our car with its fluttering flags sped between lines of cheering people all the way. Men stood by the roadside with uncovered heads as they saw the Stars and Stripes whirl by. Women waved their handkerchief while tears coursed down their cheeks. As we neared Brussels, news of our coming spread, and soon we were passing between solid walls of Belgians who waved hats and canes and handkerchiefs and screamed, Vive l'Amérique, vive l'Amérique. I'm not ashamed to say that a lump came in my throat and tears dimmed my eyes. To these helpless, homeless, hopeless people, the red, white, and blue banner that streamed from our windshield really was a flag of the free. Um, and then comes in this person, um, Herbert Hoover. Um, Herbert Hoover, who uh, organized the Commission for Relief in Belgium in October 1914. Uh, he had some business interests and friends in Belgium. Um, Hoover 
as you know, later to become US president, was already a successful engineer and businessman. Um, he directed mining enterprises, employing 100,000 men around the world. He was known as a highly capable man of force, and now he devoted his great abilities and energies to creating an unprecedented relief agency that could purchase, transport, and distribute food in wartime to the entire civilian population of Belgium. Um, it's not too much to say that it's thanks to Herbert Hoover that the Belgian population didn't starve in the First World War. Uh, with masterful publicity and propaganda, he appealed to the people of the United States for money to buy food, to charter a fleet of ships. Um, he worked without pay without and with help from devoted friends and volunteers, and thus he created a unique humanitarian entity, um, which is basically a large NGO, as we would call it uh, today. <clears throat> um, Hoover's two most important allies on the ground in Belgium uh, are these two people, to the left, Brand Whitlock, um, and to the right, Emil Franqui. Uh, Brand Whitlock was the plenipotentiary minister, so later to become ambassador, but that was the title he had in 1914, of the United States in Belgium from 1914 to 1921, and he actually coordinated the work of the Commission for Relief in, in Belgium, in occupied Belgium, um, until the American declaration of war. Um, and after that, after April 1917, his work would be the, 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 the system he had established uh, was taken over by the then still neutral, and for the rest of the war, neutral Spanish and Dutch ambassadors. Um, so but it was basically him who established that system. And then um, Emile Franqui, who was actually um, the Belgian, um, Belgian friends and the most important uh, Belgian ally of Herbert um, Hoover. Um, some words of E. Alexander Paul regarding Herbert Hoover, uh, uh, regarding, sorry, uh, Brandt Whitlock, the ambassador, um, which clearly describes him as a, a strong-willed person. After the civil administration had been established and Belgium had become, in theory at last, a German province, Mr. Whitlock was told quite plainly that the kingdom to which he was accredited had ceased to exist as an independent nation and that Anglo-American affairs in Belgium could henceforward be entrusted to the Ambar American ambassador in Berlin. But Mr. Whitlock was as impervious to German suggestions and told Baron von der Goltz, who was the German governor, politely but quite firmly that he did not take his orders from Berlin, but from Washington. God in Himmel, exclaimed the Germans, shrugging their shoulder despairingly. What is to be done with such a man? End of quote. Now, Franqui whom you see to the right, became the president of the National Committee. And the National Committee, so you actually had the Commission for Relief in Belgium, which organized the aid relief, um, the funding in the States, but also in other countries, uh, bought the aid goods, shipped them over to mainly Rotterdam, and then in Belgium they were distributed by a National Committee headed by Emile Franqui, to the right. Um, the first relief efforts began at the end of September 1914. For instance, it was in that case unemployed residents of Brussels receiving free soup. Um, however, it became clear these isolated actions were of no avail, avail and then Franqui and some other industrialists and politicians put their heads together, decided to start that National Committee for Food and Relief, as it was officially called. Um, so they organized an aid campaign both within Belgium and abroad, and they held contact with the Commission for Relief in Belgium. Some figures. Between January 1915 and December 1918, 3.2 million tons of food were shipped to Belgium. And the relief supplies were initially in intended simply as a supplement, but it appeared that for many people, this was all they had to live on. The person who wrote this book, Edward Eirhunt, uh, represented the Commission for Leave in Belgium in the Antwerp province, and he published this book in uh, 1916 on, his, on the relief work. Um, quote from this book, 
Although the Americans and Belgium perform a variety of functions, they are here primarily, prim primarily for two purposes. A, to see that the Germans strictly observe the guarantee against requisitioning food supplies, and B, to see that every Belgian man, woman, and child receives his daily bread, hence the title, War Bread. Um, <clears throat> 8,000 tons a month was imported from uh, Rotterdam into Belgium. So enormous costs, and the enormous costs had to be adjusted for, and that's why um, the system worked as does. You had a national committee, which then relied to national committee, provincial committees, and then local committees. And up until the level of provincial committees, you always had Americans uh, to supervise uh, the whole system. As a neutral country, they could do so, um, and they could guarantee uh, that all goods were delivered where they were. And as to the right, you see one of these soup kitchens for the poorest. Um, very important and still lingering on in the collective memory is the so-called American shops, where, for instance, um, clothes were sold cheaply, um, but also food. But clothing was quite important because um, the war had come at harvest time, August 1914, when clothes are a secondary consideration, and many people had never had the opportunity to provide themselves for winter. So certainly in the first year of the war, uh, clothing, um, providing the right clothing was um, important. There was an extremely wide range of aid. Uh, another quote from the book by Hunt, uh, where he gives a description of all the kinds of aid. The National Committee and the Provincial Committees are divided into two departments. The Commercial Department, d'alimentation, thus food, and the Benevolent Department, called de secours. Under the Benevolent Department are five important divisions. Money, food, clothing and shoes, work, and housing. There are committees for the aid and protection of refugees, the aid and protection of families of officers and under officers deprived of their income due to the war, aid and protection of Belgian doctors and pharmacists, aid and protection of artists, aid and protection of children and orphans of war, aid and protection of the homeless, aid and protection of damaged churches, aid and protection of the unemployed, protection of foreigners, aid and protection of lace makers, a special commission for temporary houses and the work of reconstruction, a Belgian commission for information for prisoners of war and the interned, a central committee for the aid of invalids of war, a canteen for prisoners of war, and a Belgian national league against tuberculosis. So you see it's an extremely wide range of um, aid departments. Um, but basically, last thing I'll tell you about the Commission for Leave in Belgium, um, it was a complete success. Um, it was economically, uh, it, it was economical and unbureaucratic. These are the words of Herbert Hoover himself in June the 7th, 1917. The food reached the people in the quickest space of time without less loss and without deduction. It is still considered by historians as really an example of a successful NGO and of aid relief in wartime. But of course, the money had to come from somewhere, and that was mainly the US. So, which means that all over the states, um, you had uh, kind of aid relief and uh, fundraising um, organized. These are just two examples. Um, this garden carnival organized by, um, what is it again? Uh, something, the children of Staten Island for the children of Belgium. Or this one, which is particularly uh, nice, a Belgian-American, Henry van Slembroek. Uh, who wrote the appeal, and then in French, l'appel, and in Dutch, Spanish, den Hauptfried. Uh, and the title of this organization in Dutch for the Belgian Americans was Troosje Bloeit in Twelde, which means it's a very funny name. Uh, a rose is blossoming in, in the wild, in the heat. So. <clears throat> Um, and as of September 1914, you had one senator and minister of state called Louis de Sadeleer, whom you see to the right. Uh, and he was part of a Bel special Belgian mission to the United States to find support, to raise funds, and to set up assistance programs for the Belgian population. He did so mainly from New York, 
and he knew how to choose, even if his country was at war, he knew how to choose where to base himself because he was staying in the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, we do have his archive in our museum. It's very interesting. This is a small summary of gifts uh, which he dressed on December the 25th, so Christmas 1914. So what did he receive from Cardinal Farley? $50 from Cornelius Vanderbilt the third, five thousand. Uh, there's another well-known name, um, Carnegie. Um, and so it's written on the letterhead of the Waldorf Astoria. Or then, for instance, a letter of thanks to John Rockefeller, offering him an embroidered flower bag and a ring made by a Belgian soldier um, in May 1915, 1916. The embroidered flower bag, that's a very interesting thing because uh, they're very interesting items which you can easily find all over the States in collections, but also in Belgium, uh, though I think that the larger bulk is to be found here. Um, so the Commission for Relief in Belgium shipped hundreds of tons of flour packed in cotton bags to Belgium. But cotton could also be used by the Germans in their warfare industry. And so... Um, that meant that its distribution was carefully checked by the Commission for Relief in Belgium. And the empty bags were preferably sent to schools, to sewing workshops, to convents, and to artists to have them treated and turn them into works of art. And the flower bags were often turned, as you can see, well, as you can see, this is simply embroidered into small artworks. They were then shipped back to the United States as either signs of appreciation or to be sold at fundraising events. And actually these flower bags became the very symbol of American food aid during the First World War and the emblem of Belgium's gratitude. And I'll just show you some other examples. Um, over here, really nice embroidery and then with the lace, uh, often combined with lace. Um, I'll just give you one example, one quote uh, of a letter accompanying one of these flower bags written by a young child, uh, Achille Maas, from St. Joseph's School in Tamsa, which is a, a smaller town. And this young child wrote the following. Dear America, I thank you because you sent great big boats over the great sea. Eat boats, rice, corn, bacon, stockings, clothing, and shoes. I know that you like the little Belgians, and I like you too. And of course. <laughs> This is a very nice one, uh, painted uh, scenes of Brussels. Um, this is the town hall of Brussels. You can see the cathedral of Brussels. And then where later, well, this is the monument, the site of the unknown soldier. Um, and then the message is clear. American, from over, American ships from over the sea, near Flemish bells ring out with glee. Or this kind of, of quite, um, quite well, primitive, but still very nice uh, paintings. It's the kind of scene that you see often reproduced even on small uh, small objects. Um, this is Great for Belgium, and the message is quite clear. So that this was really, you, you have, for instance, there are hundreds of um, group photographs of school parties, of children, of school children, with a photograph of Woodrow Wilson, and the Belgian king and queen with Belgian and American flags uh, sent as a postcard to uh, the US. So there are many, many of these examples uh, of that uh, gratitude for food relief. Brings me to the next subject, and that's the presence of American nurses at and behind the front line. Um, I'll just mention some individuals because, frankly, until now, we do not know how many American nurses exactly have been sent over. They were active in a number of associations and uh, capacities. One of the first was Helen Gleason. That's not her. Helen Gleason, uh, born in Cedar Rapids. She was already living in Paris. She followed her husband, who was a journalist for the New York Tribune, to the front. She joined Dr. Dr. Munro's Flying Ambulance Corps, um, which was actually very interesting, mainly British Ambulance Corps. Uh, founded by a feminist doctor who said, well, women can also serve at the front line. Um, so she served there in uh, 19, September 1914, and she wrote a chapter in his book, 
Uh, her husband's book, Golden Lads, How the Invading War Machine Crossed Belgium, the foreword was by Theodore Roosevelt. And her motivation was mainly adventure. But during the very first round of assistant in an operating theater, she fainted. Um, but she soon hardened. In 1915, she was then decorated by King Albert of the Belgians uh, to return to the States in the summer of 1915. Now, at the outbreak of war, Mary Borden, who you see to the right, um, born in Chicago, she was in England. Yeah. She was in England and she used her own money and that of donors to set up a field hospital at the front. And under the control of the French army, she set up a field hospital near Ypres, near our hometown. Um, her method was successful and that was later followed on the Somme battlefields. Her descriptions initially received a lot of criticism from established society, um, which usually painted a different picture about the events of war. And as a result, it lasted until um, 1929, before her book, The Forbidden Zone, found a willing publisher. During World War II, Borden's knowledge was used to set up a similar relief organization. I'll just read you one excerpt of her book, The Forbidden Zone. Um, so this is in a French field hospital she set up in Belgium. There are no men here, so why should I be a woman? There are heads and knees and mangled testicles. There are chests with holes as big as your fist and pulpy thighs shapeless and stumps where legs once were fastened. There are eyes, eyes of sick dogs, sick cats, blind eyes, eyes of delirium, and mouths that cannot articulate, and parts of faces, the nose gone or the jaw. There are these things, but no man, so how could I be a woman here and not die of it? Sometimes, suddenly, all in an instant, a man looks up at me from the shambles. A man's eyes signal or a voice calls, sister, sister. Sometimes, suddenly, a smile flickers on a pillow, white, blinding, burning, and I die of it. I feel myself dying again. It is impossible to be a woman here. One must be dead. Certainly, they were men once, but no, they are no longer men. So quite hard and harsh publication of what she lived through. Then um, to the left, Louisville-born nurse Alan Lamotte, who volunteered to go to Europe to treat wounded soldiers, encouraged to do so by her friend, the writer Gerdrude Stein. Um, who was living in Paris at that time. In Belgium, Lamotte served in Borden's field hospital, and uh, she as well kept a bitter diary detailing the horrors she experienced on a daily basis. In 1916 already, it was published as The Backwash of War, the human wreckage of the battlefield as witnessed by an American hospital nurse. Despite its initial success, the brutal imagery was unpalatable, and the book was banned by the US government in 1917, not to be republished before 1934. However, according to some, Ernest Hemingway's influential, unadorned style was heavily influenced by Lamotte. Just a very short fragment. Um, at a certain moment, she describes how a Belgian civilian, age 10, is brought into the hospital, so which is basically a military hospital, but this boy of 10 is brought in wounded. Um, and then she writes, after a most searching operation, the Belgian civilian was sent over to the ward to live or die as circumstances determined. As soon as he came out of ether to, uh, for the operation, uh, he began to bowl for his mother. Being 10 years of age, he was unreasonable and bowled for her incessantly and could not be pacified. The patients were greatly annoyed greatly annoyed by this disturbance, and there was indignation that the welfare and comfort of useful soldiers should be interfered with by the whims of a futile and useless civilian, a Belgian child at that. So again, quite harsh, quite cruel. Not all nurses survived. This is Helen Fairchild. When the US declared war on Germany in the spring of 1917, um, she, she was born in Milton, Pennsylvania, volunteered for overseas duty together with 63 other nurses of the Pennsylvania Hospital. She was immediately sent to Europe as one of the first Americans, where she went to work in, a, in British hospitals behind the front line. Um, in this case, base hospital number 10 at Le Treport, and then later casualty creating stations, num station number four, sorry, number four, Dozingham, near Proven, which is in Flanders. Um, she herself became ill, in early 1918, 
and she died on 18 January 1918 from an acute liver disease. And then after the war, her body was buried in the American military cemetery in Bonny on the Somme, but she basically died in Flanders. Still in the medical field and not yet uh, and already active before the Americans officially joined the war effort, uh, probably the most famous doctor, uh, American doctor active in uh, Flanders during the First World War, Harvey Cushing, uh, mentioned his name to a doctor and certainly to a neuro neurologist, neurosurgeon, and they will all know him because we've got several. He was a Harvard professor and there were certain uh, operations and syndromes named um, after him. So Harvey Cushing, um, who achieved a breakthrough in neurologic, neurological and brain surgery before the First World War, um, left for France after war broke out, um, together with a Harvard ambulance unit. Um, interestingly enough, you had a kind of competition to who would raise the most money and establish the largest uh, ambulance unit, Harvard or Yale. And there's even a photograph where you see an ambulance of Harvard and an ambulance of Yale together on one uh, postcard. So there was this kind of, already then, that kind of competition. In the spring of 1915, he studied the French and British medical services, um, then returned to America to train doctors. In May 1917, he returned to the front, and during the Dirt Battle of Ypres, better known as Passchendaele, he was a surgeon at the field hospital Mandingham in Proven. In November 1917, he would leave the salient. Um, he, he was really exhausted by the war. At the end of World War I, he could hardly stand on his legs due to the long hours of work during which he was on his feet. Um, and he basically had to seek treatment for that, suffer from it since uh, the end of the war. Um, he published a fantastic book uh, from a surgeon's journal, again, um, a short quote from that book. Um, so he's telling about the field hospital in which he's active. The place, as I have said somewhere before, is called Mendingham. This was originally a joke and was to have been Endingham, but on second, second thought was changed as being too much even for the British Tommy. The army has a professional name maker, I may add. Mandingham is already on the printed maps, and there is in this district a bandage M and dosing M, which I have not located as yet. Sir Anthony told me that there would be 15 casualty clearing stations for the 5th Army. They are probably all more or less like ours. 200 actual beds, which may expand to 1,200 or 1,300 and may take in without the struggle, as did number 46, that's his uh, casualty clearing stations the day before I got here, 1,000 mustard gas cases. A day. Poor devils. I've seen too many of them since, new ones, their eyes bandaged, led along by a man with a string while they try to keep to the duck boards. Some of the after effects are as extraordinary as they are horrible. The slowing of the genitals, for, in, for example. They had about 20 fatalities out of the first thousand cases, chiefly from bronchial troubles. Fortunately, vision does not appear to be often lost. And finally, in this section before I hand over the floor to my colleague, uh, the American Red Cross. The American Red Cross played an important and not yet sufficiently researched and by consequence unacknowledged role in aid to the civilian population, um, not only during, but also immediately after the First World War. From May 1917 onwards in an official capacity, mainly active in the Little Corner Never Conquered, that's also the title of a book written by one of their members, which is the 3% of Belgium behind the front line in West Flanders, where still 90,000 civilians were living right behind the fighting zone. But they were also active among the Belgian refugees in France, uh, not a small number, 350,000 Belgian refugees living in France at that stage. They were helping children in the front zone, they built a little hospital, uh, they built a dugout shelter, as you can see uh, over there. They helped evacuating refugees, finding accommodation for them. Um, they also helped the refugees in exile, for instance, organizing childcare for children whose mothers worked in the munition factories in France. Um, and, and I think this is the last quote for my part, Peter, so prepare yourself. Um, a typical fragment for the book, from the book, The Little Corner Never Conquered, um, published by Colonel van Schaik of 
the American Red Cross, um, and he's talking about Vincent Naert, a little boy of six, lived with his father and mother and sister at Ypres. The father was a gendarme, so a policeman. Standing at his post one day during an air raid, a piece of bomb struck him in the side. For four months, he lay in Countess von den Steen's hospital in Poppering, and then he died. The mother stayed on, living as best as she could doing washing for the troops until the first day of the shelling of Ypres in April 1915. During the hate of the bombardment, just as she had taken little Vincent in her arms to comfort him, a great bomb came with a screech and bang and crash, smashing the house. It beheaded the mother, but left the child unhurt, drenched in his mother's blood. English Quakers quickly came and took little Vincent away. They turned him over to Abbé de Lare, whom the American Red Cross was helping at Wiske, which is another village. There he found a second home, multiplied this story 10,000 times, not always with such gruesome details, but sometimes with more gruesome details. And you have the child problem of the firing line. The American Red Cross was active in an enormous variety of activities, uh, mostly just financial. They raised $400 million, uh, amongst the American people through the American Red Cross war relief. And of these, only 5 million were handled directly by the Commission for Relief of Belgium of the ARC. And the rest they handed over to a large, this is just one example, a large number of uh, welfare um, organizations. Now it's my turn to sip, take a sip of water. And Peter, I hand you over. Well, thank you. And thank you, Rob, and your place for having us, for organizing this. Thank you for coming. Um, I will continue with the Americans in a military capacity in Belgium. Um, first, those um, uh, who didn't serve with the, with the, uh, with the American uh, army. So the further Europe evolved in this war, the more Woodrow Wilson policies came under pressure. Wilson had to strike a balance between pacifism, neutrality politics, and increasingly loud voices to enter the war. The US had remained neutral, but it had been an important um, supplier to the United King Kingdom, uh, France, and the other powers um, of the allies of, the, of World War I. And in the meantime, many Americans have already traveled to um, to, um, to Europe by the end of 1914, particularly to provide humanitarian uh, aid, as my dear colleague Dominic has outlined um, in the past half hour. There were others, though, um, who wanted to fight, too. So they traveled to Canada and joined the Canadian Expeditionary Force. By the end of 1914, over 2,000 had already joined. Um, to fight against uh, the Germans. In 1915, uh, their number had reached to 6,000, June 1916 to 16,000, and February 1917 to, to 50,000. Now, we can uh, measure this uh, evolution by some figures extracted from our long-term research project called the List of Names, which is, in a nutshell, the um, the list of names aims to, um, to draw up an inclusive register, both of civilians and military of any origin, um, whose death was related to the First World War in Belgium. And it includes approximately 600,000 war dead, with origins in uh, 120 present-day countries. It is based on extensive comparison um, and analysis of a wide range of sources. Uh, this list of names tries to map out as much information as possible on each individual. And this makes the list of names a unique tool um, offering new perspectives on the history of the First World War in Belgium. Now, thanks to the list of names, um, we were able to identify at least 759 casualties who were born in the USA, but did um, not die in an American uniform. 80% of them served either with the British or Canadian Expeditionary Forces, but for examples, we also find some of them who died in Flanders wearing an Australian, a French, a German, 
or a Belgium uniform. Interesting stories of pre-war migration, but I'll focus on those who joined the Canadian and the British Army. So if we order these casualties chronologically by year, we can clearly see that they follow um, the general evolution. In 1914, we count the 36 um, war dead, all serving in the British uh, Army. Uh, all, all of them were pre-war uh, migration stories. But in 1915, we count um, 93 uh, casualties, and all these were cases of volunteering, volunteering um, with the uh, Canadian Army. In 1916, we see these numbers increasing, um, but uh, in 1917, this evolution comes to a climax uh, with 319 American-born war dead. Um, and it's it's interesting when you um, when you see the places where they enlisted, Winnipeg, Montreal, places that were attainable if you crossed the border. Um, but in some cases, it was also just a matter of crossing a river. If you consider uh, Detroit and Windsor, for instance, you see it's just a matter of crossing uh, the river. Uh, needless to say that the figures uh, I showed. Uh, Take a free fall in 1918, 44 uh, to be exactly, um, after the United States um, entered the war and raised its own army. Uh, but the point is that these Americans crossing the border to go fighting in the war caused, um, caused um, a certain embarrassment um, to Wilson's neut neutral politics. Um, and these people um, who died in, um, in another uniform in Flanders are commemorated uh, in, in Commonwealth War Graves Commissions uh, as well. So, But some of them are still commemorated by their American um, descendants putting American flags on these uh, cemeteries, as you can see. Um, I won't go into the course uh, that eventually led the U.S. to... Um, to war participation, you probably know that better than I do, than we do. But on 6th April 1917, the United States declared um, the war on Germany, as you know. And then um, when they were officially at war, uh, they did face the fact that actually they were not prepared for a possible military uh, confrontation or intervention. An army had to be raised. Uh, and the establishment of the American Expeditionary Force would turn out to be a slow process. When General John Pershing uh, was assigned as a general of the armies in May 1917, the National Army only consisted of 135,000 men. And although um, different sources provide different figures, one month after the declaration of war, only 1,300 and, uh, Americans had landed in France. Now, by the end of 1917, their number had reached um, to 180,000, but the majority of the troops still needed extensive training. So it was Pers Pershing's uh, first priority um, to establish training schools for his officers and respective uh, divisions. Afterwards, these officers would provide the basic principles of machine guns, mortars, uh, chemical warfare, digging and maintaining trenches to their men, and so on. Um, now, in May 1918, the AEF had uh, expanded considerably uh, to with almost 250,000 men landed in France, and subsequent months would show similar or even higher numbers. So the U.S. would manage to mobilize 49 divisions, fully or partly, and send them overseas. And one must realize that at the time, an American division, um, on an average, amounted to 25,000 men, uh, which was at least double the numbers um, in, in British, French, or Belgian uh, divisions. By 11 November 1918, more than 2 million American soldiers were stationed in Europe. And their participation, the participation of American troops um, in this conflict was an enormous moral boost and support to the Allies. And of course, this uh, was also used in the propaganda towards uh, the Germans. Now, of the 49 US divisions, 
that fought in the Great War, four were effectively uh, deployed in Flanders fields. Between five, the 5th of July and, and the beginning of September 1918, the 27th and uh, the 30th divisions would be engaged in a sector south of Ypres under general command of uh, the Second British Army. And then secondly, the 37th and the 91st divisions would be involved in the final offensive uh, leading up to the armistice uh, under the general command of King Al Albert of uh, Belgium. Now, it's not my intention to explain all the exploits uh, of these four divisions um, in detail, but I would like to, um, to say briefly something about uh, each of them. Uh, first of all, maybe a little bit of, of, of context. So in the spring of 1918, um, before the arrival of the mass of Americans uh, in Europe, and with the help of divisions released uh, from the Eastern Front after the collapse of Tsarist Russia, the Germans had launched an offensive in the spring uh, of 1918. Um, they realized that it was the momentum to try to force a breakthrough at the Western Front. So uh, German troops pounded the Allied lines between 21 March uh, 1918 and the end of April uh, 1918. Um, they made considerable ground gains, but did not force this decisive breakthrough. From July 1918, the Allies would... Um, uh, would launch counterattacks, counteroffensive, which slowly but surely pushed back the exhausted uh, Germans. Despite withstanding the German spring offensive, the Allied armies had taken serious blows and were exhausted too. So therefore, the arrival of American divisions was welcome, so too in Flanders. And in July, the first two uh, arrived, uh, the 27th and the 30th uh, division. Now, the, the 27th Division was uh, better known as the New York Division, and they consisted of men coming from the New York National Guard. They were all in France uh, in France by July 1918, and um, they were immediately attached to the British Second Army, which was operating southwest uh, of Ypres. And during this period, um, in the very first uh, phase, um, a selected group was able to gain their first frontline experience. One of them was Corporal William Billy Leonard of the 107th Infantry uh, Regiment. Before putting on his uniform, he worked as a journalist for the Daily Times in Flushing, New Queens, New York. Um, and as soon as he was plunged into the real war in, in Ypres, he realized it was completely different from what could be imagined beforehand uh, on the training grounds in the States or in France uh, behind, behind the lines. To a friend home, he wrote, I've seen a lot the censor won't let, won't let me tell. You bet someday I'll give you the story between puffs of your excellent cigars. Billy volunteered on a, for a mission on 14 July just to see how it goes. In his letters, he described the sleepless nights due to heavy artillery fire, which he experienced as very enervating. To another friend, he wrote, the nearer we get to the trenches, the less we think about the war in its larger aspects. I imagine it's because we are cut off from the world, in a sense. Rarely see a newspaper and our own particular job fills our time and thoughts. Billy died on uh, the 14th of July, 1918, when he was sent into the no man's land to repair some uh, barbed wire in, um, uh, in the no man's land. And an artillery shell burst very close to him and shell fragments lodged into his stomach. He died on the first day uh, in the front line, uh, which happens, which happened to, to many others as well in, in, in different armies, which is very tragic. But his colleagues of the 27th Division would soon after discover uh, the real faces of trench uh, warfare. The units of the 27th were entered in the front lines between the end of July and the end of August. And uh, in their sector, there was hardly any activity. So they were mainly ordered to carry out reconnaissance missions. Um, and they were relieved on, in the beginning of September uh, 1918. 
to be transferred uh, to France and to take part in the offensives uh, in the summer to uh, well in the final phase of of the war. Um, now, despite the relative calm during their time at the front in Flanders, the 27th left 243 dead uh, in there. Now, the fortunes of the of the 30th Division were similar to those of uh, the 27th, with whom they operated simultaneously in the same sector south of Ypres. This division was composed of men um, from... Um, from the North Carolina, the South Carolina, and the Tennessee National Guards, and many of them had already um, experienced their baptism of fire during the Pancho Villa uprising along the Mexican border in 1916 and 1917. And after some training in northern France, they were um, attached or divided. The units were divided under um, the under the 39th British Division, and their camp was established in uh, Watu. Batu is a very small village on the Belgian-French uh, border behind the Ypres front. And uh, although Watu was, was located in a so-called quiet sector, it was within range of um, the German artillery, so uh, which caused several uh, casualties. Curious to mention is that uh, these men were honored and surprised by some esteemed and high uh, visitors during their training period. So on the 6th of August 1918, they were honored by King George uh, V um, of England and on 7 August um, 1918 by King Albert of uh, the Belgians and his wife, Queen Elizabeth. Um, that is might all be very impressive, but more exciting for the men was the informal visit and the pleasant performance by Elsie Janice, as little Elsie, aka the sweetheart of uh, the AEF, was, was called. Elsie Janice was an actress and a singer who, accompanied by her mother, um, entertained US troops stationed in. Uh, near the front lines in Europe with a roadshow. And in after the war, she, pub, she published her wartime experiences. And uh, you, can, you can see one of those uh, performances. After the war, she published, she published her wartime experiences in uh, the big show, My Six Months with the American Expeditionary Forces, published in 1919. And uh, there is a remarkable passage in it, which is related to the 13th Division in Watu. She described the trip to Watu as really the most warlike one we had had. She constantly saw trucks, tanks, artillery, and men passing, as well as in the sky, observation balloons. They looked so useless, great big hot dogs hanging there, but how wonderful they are. And I admit that my idea of a brave man is one of those observers. They go up knowing they can't protect themselves, end of quote. She continued... Um, with I shall never forget Watu, and then describes here how her show in Watu was interrupted by another show, German airplanes attacking the Allied observation balloons. I'm not going to read the passage in full, but th this was also a very nice surprise uh, for us with, because with every um, research or new project, um, we try to find new testimonies and um, so that this one of of Elsie Janice was really a new one, a new one, and uh, I don't I don't think few people in um, Watu living there today know this, but Watu was immortalized in the in the testimony of Elsie Janice, the big star from the USA. Um, as I already told you, the 30th Division went through um, a bit of the same course as as the 27th uh, Division. They were engaged in the same sector and relieved in the same period. And during their two months of stay in Flanders, they suffered 156, 156 uh, deaths. Now, the story of the two other uh, divisions is situated in a different context. After some successful French and British American supported counterattacks in the summer of 1918, the Allied forces would launch several offensives simultaneously um, by the end of September. In Belgium, this final offensive, as it was called afterwards, was launched on the 28th September 1918, with King Albert commanding a force of Belgian, French, 
and British troops. In the first phase, they broke through the German defenses, which forced the Germans to retreat slowly but surely. In this overview map, you can see all the, the, the several phases um, with the end, uh, the, the line that was established on Armistice Day, um, 11 November 1918. Now, in the, in the third phase, um, beyond mid-October 1918, the two American divisions were sent to Flanders to give the offensive an extra punch. And these were the 37th and uh, the 1991st uh, divisions, who arrived in the vicinity of Ypres and Poperinge by uh, 20 October. Uh, Um, to um, towards the front. That was by the end of uh, October, nearing the vicinity of Waregem and, uh, and, and Oudenaarde. Oudenaarde. Uh, the 37th uh, Division was composed of men from the Ohio National Guard, and they would be attached to the, the French 6th Army and ordered to attack in the waregem oudenaarde uh, area. The main, of, uh, the main uh, objective for their attack was to reach the River Scheldt, which uh, they would finally do, take on uh, the 3rd of November 1918. German resistance had been very fierce, uh, causing many casualties. I think one of, of the four divisions, the US divisions in Flanders, the 37th suffered uh, the most. We counted at least 426 casualties. In addition, they suffered 120,200 uh, severely wounded and 2,200 uh, lightly wounded. And what is striking, um, the first 20 died in Ypres, so just after arriving. Uh, and if you see their cause of death, it was influenza. Indeed, during this period, uh, the Spanish flu began uh, raging across the European uh, continent in full force. Um, here you see some pictures of uh, this 37th uh, division in action. This is the uh, River Scheldt, the place where they crossed uh, the river. And uh, the memory of the 37th Division's uh, commitment uh, lives on to this day. Um, to commemorate the Battle of uh, the Scale, the U.S. state of Ohio donated a bridge. So this was the old bridge, but they donated a new bridge um, as a war memorial, the 37th Division Memorial Bridge, as it is called, at the site where the U.S. troops um, crossed um, the Scheld. Um, and the construction began in September 1928 and was inaugurated in, uh, on 26 September 1929. Um, finally, we have uh, the 91st Division, called the Wild West Division, which was a National Army Division. All men originated from the states of Montana, Nevada, Wyoming, Utah, Washington, Oregon, California, and Idaho. The first units arrived in Flanders on 18 October 1918, when they and, and they moved forwards towards the front um, zone in as the same um, the same course as the the 37th. Um, they took part in uh, an attack in the zone east of Wargem towards uh, Oudenaarde, uh, after which they liberated after three days uh, of uh, fighting. Um, they would stay in Aldenarde uh, until the armistice of 11 November uh, 1918. They left 262 dead in Flanders, and again, very remarkable, the first 20 so also uh, cases of Spanish flu. Now, before I move on, um, there's a, a side story which we discovered, um, very remarkable. On, 11, on the 11th November 1919, the front page of the Chicago Sunday Tribune showed a large family photo of the seven fighting Belgian brothers. Three of them had served as Americans or in an American uniform and four as Belgian soldiers. Um, two of them uh, moved to the States before the First World War and their enthusiasm for the unlimited opportunities in the new world prompted the other ones 
um, and, and, and even two sisters to migrate to the States. And so some of them returned to Belgium at the start of the war to join the Belgian army and others got enlisted in the US army to, uh, to go to Flanders. All seven of them um, survived. So it's a special side story, but these stories as well are uh, in the scoop of our project, uh, which I will tell you more about uh, later on. Now, considering um, the magnitude of the pro of, of um, oh sorry, now after the armistice, after the war, a huge challenge awaited the warring parties on various levels, of course, but certainly too in terms of uh, recovering the dead and dealing um, dealing with their legacy, their sacrifice, and the organization of, of the cemeteries. That was, that was something, something huge. And for the USA, this task was in the first phase, mainly appointed to uh, the American Grace Registration Service. Considering the magnitude of, of the project in supervising more than 73,000 graves, the overseas AGRS unit in charge soon became a department with more uh, than 150 officers and 7,000 employees. And their first assignment was to identify the remains and re register the exact location in each zone of action, which was not an easy task if you bear in mind the inhuman conditions of uh, the battlefields and the fact that victims sometimes had to be buried in very chaotic circumstances. A hasty burial would be marked by a rifle or an improvised cross and even sometimes only with a stick uh, in the ground. The unit started their work in Europe from um, October 1917 and they had two main concerns. First, to regroup and consolidate graves and commence the construction of temporary cemeteries with the intention of establishing permanent memorial sites. The second was to prepare the process of repatriation, as the American government had promised in 1917 to repatriate all dead to the US. However, they had greatly underestimated the numbers involved and two years had passed since the armistice with no progress in sight and public opinion was not was not favorable towards the government and finally after some painful um, incidents with private undertakers repatriating bodies the u.s government finally released um, funds to carry out this operation in a systematical uh, manner the official closing date for next of kin to make the decision the decision of on the final disposition of uh, remains was 1st of April 1922. By 15 May 1922, a total of more than 45,000 remains had been repatriated to the United States and uh, 30,000 of them had been shipped via the port of Antwerp. This is uh, in the port of Antwerp, um, which became the largest uh, port in Europe executing these operations. Now, parallel to uh, the organization of repatriation was the organization of permanent U.S. cemeteries in Europe. To manage this, the Battle Monuments Board, later to become the American Battle Monuments Commission, was established in 1921. Initially, there were only um, uh, six sites planned, five in France and one in, uh, in, in the UK. However, in August 1921, it was decided that for practical reasons to develop a number of additional permanent sites. The number of permanent cemeteries in Europe were extended from six to eight uh, with the Was in American Cemetery and Flanders Fields American Cemetery uh, in Waregem here, um, so in which brings us to uh, the final part of our talk, the legacies uh, of U.S. presence in, in Flanders. Uh, I was talking about this additional site, uh, Waregem, before the decision, Flanders Field Waregem had become had already become a kind of terminal um, during the identification process and subsequent repatriation uh, of, remains, of remains. 
Statistics show that 1,027 men had been centralized there by May 1922, and those remains were designated to be transferred and permanently interned, interred in, uh, an, um, in the American cemetery in France, in Somme, located in Bonny. But local commissioners and uh, Flanders and political stakeholders had already taken steps much earlier to establish a temporary site in Waregem. Between, let's say, January 1919 and March 1922, talks were held, uh, lobbying and negotiating was done, um, decisions were made, and by 23 March, 19, March 1922, all the preparations were finalized. So the site of Flanders Fields American Cemetery was donated by the Belgian government in perpetuity for the use of a military cemetery. The ABNC had um, visited Flanders, Waregem, a first time in June 1924. At the, at the moment, there were 367 graves, but in 1930s, the remains of, Amer of an American soldier were found in the River Scheldt, bringing the total to 368. A chapel with a wall of missing was um, with 43 names inscribed, was integrated and inaugurated. <laughs> on Memorial Day 1930. Flanders Field uh, American Cemetery, as we know it today, was inaugurated in 1937. On the same day, American federal monuments were inaugurated in Audenarde and Kemmel as well. In Audenarde, dedicated to the memory of the 37th and the 91st Divisions, and in Kemmel, dedicated to the memory of the 27th and the 30th uh, Divisions who were engaged in that region. However, the this is American Fields Cemetery. However, the commemoration of the U.S. presence in Flanders Fields had long started before uh, the inauguration of the Flanders Fields American Cemetery in 1937. <coughs> Several memorial days were organized to pay respect to the dead. Uh, as of 1923, the Waregem school children sang already the American national anthem uh, during during the um during the ceremonies and this is this is here um there had also been several memorable moments that can be recalled to name two to name two in 1927 nine days after his solo transatlantic flight charles Lindbergh flew over the cemetery in his spirit of St. Louis, and dropped a bouquet of flowers um, in his silk flying scarf in honor of his fallen countryman. I haven't a photograph of that yet. But, um, and then at um, on two, the 2nd of July 1930, the Gold Star Mothers, as they were known, a pilgrimage group of mothers and widows of, of, the, of the fallen, visited uh, the cemetery, which you can see uh, on the right here. Uh, and for each participant, um, a floral wreath was ordered, which was placed at the grave of their loved one. And since then, the several, uh, several prominent um, U.S. personalities have visited the cemetery, including a number of presidents such as George Bush, Bush Sr. and Jr., and uh, Barack Obama. Um, now, for con to continue the legacies, I'll, I'll pass the floor to Dominic again. Um, but actually, these visits to the front lines started um, much earlier. Um, already in 1919, we know that officers, um, British of uh, American officers from France, when they had the opportunity, wanted to see that famous town of Ypres, the city of Ypres, for themselves. So you already had like kind of touristic visits by the end of the war and certainly in 1919. And the most famous person who did so was actually uh, Woodrow Wilson, um, who visited Ypres and the battlefields of 18 of June 1919. Yep. Yeah. Um, this is before there is sound film, so it's a silent film. Obviously, you see Wilson arriving. It's a five-minute film. It's nice to see it. Um, so you see him arriving by train, and this is the Belgium Guard of Honor, um, and he's accompanied uh, by um, King Albert of the Belgians. There he is, and I'll just go a little bit further because
I'll just let it run because I'm, I'm a bit afraid that I would <laughs> disappear all of a sudden. I have this capacity of, even when I look at the computer, sometimes they, they go astray. Yeah. So you recognize uh, Wilson? I do not know whether he was accompanied by his wife or his mistress. They were both in Paris at that moment. And this is the Queen of the Belgians, Elizabeth. Here, that's the King of Belgium, King Albert, and uh, the President. And this is the car for the Queen of the Belgians. So first they visit Newport, which is the city was was on the uh, on the coast, where you already see the destruction. Um, this was actually, well, not really a fact-finding mission. Uh, it was more like a tourist and symbolic visit to the destroyed cities in Flanders. Uh, but this is in the run-up to the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. We're in the middle of June uh, 1919. Um, you already see the destruction in that part um, of the front line. And you have to be you have to realize that the places he is visiting are at that stage still uninhabited. The only people you would see around are a few of the first arrivals, first refugees who return, uh, but mainly, uh, mainly visitors, tourists who are eager to see for themselves the famous uh, battlefields. But for us, obviously, the most interesting part is when he visits uh, Ypres or hometown. You can easily recognize the king of the Belgians because he's, he was a very tall guy. He's usually the tallest of all. So here they are visiting trenches, uh, already overgrown by weed. Uh, this is uh, lunch. They had lunch. It was a picnic in Houthost Forest, Houthost Forest, which was very long time like a kind of, of uh, stronghold of the Germans, full of trenches. Um, the Queen of the Belgians was a very keen photographer. We do have her photographs as well, which is very nice to match it with uh, the film um, that was made. And then the next stop is Ypres. So now they are in Ypres, um, getting out of their car. Even for us, it's sometimes hard to recognize the right, uh, the right ruins. These are temporary huts being built. Um, and here we already see, yeah, this is the, sorry. Uh, uh, I told you. Uh, I'll try to fix that. You know what? I'll I'll continue my talk and then I'll, I'll during if there's questions I'll show the film again and then I'll, I'll comment on it because otherwise this could happen another three times and then uh, you're here for the rest of the evening. Yeah, um, but there are other souvenirs of the American presence in uh, in Belgium after the First World War. So when I was talking about the American Red Cross, I told you that uh, in the aftermath of the war, they still provided help. Um, and these are still two still standing structures um, realized by the American Red Cross uh, during the post-war reconstruction, um, a temporary wooden dwelling, which uh, having now been for a week, um, a full week in the States, is more 
like American architecture to me than Belgian architecture, which is quite telling, So, but it's a wooden structure. And this is quite interesting. They're right now restoring it. Um, this was built as a temporary hospital in a small town not far from Ypres. Um, and the funny thing is that um, it is now called, it is now used as a youth uh, accommodation for uh, uh, the, the Boy Scouts and so on. Um, but the name that it is having now is the ARC, the ARC. But ARC is actually the abbreviation of American Red Cross. So it has nothing to do with an ARC. It's just that the abbreviation ARK became uh, the name of, of the building. So you still see that even if few inhabitants of Wervik, the town, realize that it was built by the American Red Cross, it actually lives on in the name uh, the structure is uh, bearing. And then um, in the beginning of the talk, I talked about Leuven, Louvain. Um, Leuven, who was completely destroyed, but not completely, 10% of uh, the houses were destroyed in 1914, but also the very famous uh, university library. And it's a very a lasting, um, a lasting legacy of American aid to the reconstruction, that the building was actually uh, designed by an American architect, uh, Whitney Warren, um, and the whole structure, the whole building is a gift from the American people and namely many in, um, educational institutions. And I do not know the number, but there's certainly more than a hundred um, inscriptions. Do you know the exact number? Uh, yeah, over 200 inscriptions of schools, universities, and other institutions are inscribed on the walls of the building, sometimes with their coat of arms, sometimes in very elaborate uh, calligraphy. Um, here you see one, just one example. Um, and uh, here is uh, one of the cornerstones where you see the coat of arms of Leuven um, to the right. Um, and in, in the beginning I was talking, I, I talked about Herbert Hoover and his activities. Well, Herbert Hoover's activities in Belgium did not end with the signing of the armistice in November 1918. Um, henceforth, it would be in the scientific and in the academic fields that the American engineer would make his mark. And together with Emile Franqui, his Belgian friend who headed the National Committee, um, he decided to devote the budget surpluses, what was resting of the funds, the financial funds for the Commission for Leave in Belgium. Um, these surpluses, um, which summed up to 150 billion Belgian francs, I have no idea what that signifies today, but it certainly is a huge amount of money uh, to reconstructing the universities and higher education institutes of Belgium, as well as to creating a university foundations, uh, the proposals of which Franqui, his Belgian friend, had been developing since the middle of the, more, of the war. Um, and what is more, without waiting for the Belgian Parliament's vote, Hoover proposed that a remnant uh, of the Committee for Leaves in Belgium was to be used as the basis for creating a Belgian-American foundation intended to promote exchanges between young academics of the two countries. And the CRB, Commission for Leave in Belgium's educational foundation, came into being for this purpose already in March 1920. Um, it would later be rebaptized as the Belgian-American Educational Foundation. Um, and since it has sent abroad more than yeah, more than thousands of students, researchers, and professors to date, it's also contributed to financing several prestigious, prestigious university and scientific buildings. I believe didn't you um, profit from the BAF, Brian, as well <coughs> at one stage? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's still an important, it's still a living legacy um, of the uh, of of that American aid, which is still uh, strengthening the bond between our two countries. Now. Um 
for decades uh, until today in fact the u.s military presence was mainly uh, equated with the flanders field american cemetery and memorial in waregem at this peaceful site 411 service members of the United States Arms, Armed Forces are commemorated. And um, a beautiful book was dedicated to this cemetery, reconstructing not only the history of the cemetery, but also the stories of the men commemorated there. And all the credits to authors uh, Chris Sims and Patrick uh, Lernout uh, for that. I don't know, maybe they're listening uh, in Belgium, but no, this is this is very, uh, it was a very good job, uh, very useful and helpful to us. But what you see in the memorial landscape reveals part of the story that took place there and however what is equally important is what you don't see anymore the graves that were repatriated the original cemeteries that were cleared and the stories that faded with them and herein lies the challenge of our project we set up with the u.s embassy in brussels and with smithsonian museum americans in flanders names and places uh, to reconstruct and present the total story not just that of the cemetery that reminds us of the american presence in belgium during the first world war and the project runs from 2022 uh, to, to, to uh, 2024 and has set itself a number of targets so the first one is making the results of the project known to a wide audience by means of a traveling exhibition the second is making the results of the project permanent by means of a publication and the museum series of the list of names so we have a series dedicated to several um, groups of um, uh, of people are are to team several teams subjects in the in the um, the history of the first world war and we will dedicate um, a book to uh, the americans um a third object is enhancing the American First World War site in Belgium by developing an app containing the historical information and personal stories and thus virtually linking these sites, which will enable us to tell visitors uh, to these places, but also people from Wervik, the Ark, or Watu, what 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 is be what what stories there are that are not visible anymore uh, another part is of the project is an exchange of expertise um on the first world war research and museology that is one of the reasons that's why we're, we are here nowadays and last but not least uh, the one object that is necessary to make at least three of the four other uh, happen is to identify all American casualties who fell on Belgian soil as a result of the First World War um, and to integrate these permanently into commemorative practices. And so far we have been able to identify 1,153 American military who died in Flanders fields or are commemorated there. And we managed to discover that they were originally buried in 102 places before they were brought to Waregem or they were repatriated, mainly to the United States, but in some cases also elsewhere. And they were born in Italy, Ireland, the Netherlands, Austria, Hungary, Sweden, Czech Republic, Switzerland, Brazil, Poland, Denmark, Finland, Lithuania, Norway, Montenegro, Greece, Syria, Canada, England, the Philippines, Russia, Barbados, and last but not least, Scotland. Interesting stories, and the Euros of, uh, itself, of course. Yeah, of course, but these are um, the other countries that we also already found. So, so interesting stories, uh, and we'll be happy to keep you uh, up to date about the results of this project so you are able to discover how the United States and Belgium, through the prism of the First World War, are deeply connected to each other. Thank you. Or any questions, we are happy to answer them. And in the meanwhile, I'll <laughs> try again. Yeah, I can't. Because there were many, there were basically, oh, I have to move on to the other. Um, 
you can't replace it. Um, there were too many um, manuscripts um, and so on, but there were many gifts, as happens, as still happens today. Yeah? I mean, I remember having uh, organizing gifts from the Ipe Library for Sarajevo. Um, so you had gifts from many um, American and British and other libraries to submit for what had been lost um, during um, the 19, August 1914 fire. Uh, but disaster struck again actually in the Second World War. Um, so uh, at a certain moment, uh, part of the library went up uh, in, in fire again. Um, and then disaster struck again in the case of Leuven um, in 1968 in one way or another, because in 1968 the um, University of Leuven, who was bilingual, uh, split, and the French-speaking university settled elsewhere, so they divided up again part of the library. Um, still a great resource, uh, but it has, I mean, there were one of the most moving objects in our museum is on loan from the University of Librarian of Leuven, and it's actually a burned book set in a glass case, a little bit like a shrine. Now, if you're a book lover, this is, it's, it's an object that breaks your heart. Um, so you have this librarian who took this burned book and had it encased with a seal in, in, a, in a glass shrine. Um, it's, it's, it's a very moving, very moving object. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. Sir? How is the solution going to be, which is a colossal operation and a humanitarian one? How did it influence the thinking in the Western world afterwards? That's a huge question, and I will be—I'll uh, be—I will be honest. I do not know. However, however, um, as it was, it was certainly very influential, um, and it has set a model. Um, there is a book by, no, I forgot the name of the of the scholar. Uh, sorry, no, no, no. And there's also um, the, the 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 guy, the um, American historian who wrote the um, the biography of Hoover, and the title is Hoover the Great Humanitarian. George Nash, yeah. George Nash published a two volume um, biography of Hoover called the Great Humanitarian, in which part of the book, of course, it's a broader overview of Hoover's life, uh, but part of it is really on, hence the title, The Great Humanitarian, um, is that he's focusing on uh, how Hoover invented modern aid relief, war relief, uh, which set an example uh, further on. But I will be honest, it is not really my field of subject. I have, we already have so much to do regarding our small parts and the four years, five years uh, of war. So um, it's just pointing you out to another direction to, to learn more about it. Sir? Uh, thank you, Andrea. Um, I know at the time in 1914, the US had a large German American population. Yeah. First yeah. Can you speak as much on behalf of that in terms of seeing that on the other side? I mean, there's a lot yes. of American expeditions on the Canadian yeah. British. Yeah, I will do so immediately, just perhaps now, because we're now, <laughs> right now in Ypres, and I will not touch this. Yeah, I will switch this off, yeah. So just, and then I remember your question, I will answer. So this is the top wall, and they're actually turning around the cloth hall, which was one of the most famous uh, buildings. It was one of, together with the cathedral in Reims, uh, perhaps the example of uh, medieval heritage, heritage destroyed uh, in a modern industrial uh, war. So you see them walking through the ruins. Um, that's actually in front of the cathedral. So the, the, the montage of the film is not really in a strict uh, chronological order. But you see how the town of Ypres looked like in 1919. You can just see there are no houses in front of this apartments. Uh, the rubble is overgrown by bad weeds. And uh, you can just, uh, this is the cathedral. Huge pile, just some remains standing. Yeah. And this is basically our office. 
So that's the museum building, and, and this row, yeah, where Peter is pointing out, that's where we are today. Um, the museum office is, is, is based. Uh, and you actually, you can't read it, probably, but it says, it's dangerous to, take, to dig in ruins, because you already had the early returning Belgians who were recuperating stones to uh, build temporary housings. Yeah, that was mainly it. Uh, German-Americans. Uh, well, interesting questions. Uh, you would find them on both sides. Um, you had a bit the same divide. You have the same uh, phenomenon with uh, German Canadians. Um, you even had the same phenomenon with some German Belgians, uh, where some uh, ended up on the Allied side because they had completely familiarized and they were completely embedded in their new home society, as to say, and that was stronger than their uh, official roots. However, um, it's not an American example, but a Canadian example, which I find very interesting. Uh, when I wrote my book on the Menin Gate, which is the large memorial in Ypres, I came across a letter written by a German-Canadian family. And they said, well, you have to correct our name, the name of our son on the Menin Gate, because on the Menin Gate, on the memorial to the missing, it, le it reads Schwartfager. And they explicitly write, yeah, you should correct it to Schwartfager because we're German. So you see that you've got this mixing, mixed, uh, mixed heritage yeah, and, and, and mixed identities. Um, I have no doubt that some uh, German-born uh, um, yeah, German Americans joined the German army, um, which was also the case, for instance, for many Danes. Um, but I think, I think that most would... Uh, I think that most would have served on, on the Allied side, but I'm not at all sure about that. What is also very interesting is uh, Germans and German military who, after the war, uh, migrated to the States. And the reason I mention that is because the most poignant witness account that we have of the first gas attack in world history, which took place at Ypres on 22nd of April 1915, is by a uh, German-American, a guy who served with a German pioneer regiment in 1915 and migrated to the States in 1920. Uh, he's in Zeebrugge now, in um, And it's two decades later, he tells his son what had happened to him during the first gas attack. And he, his son is born in California, so he tells it in English. So the most poignant witness account we have of the first gas attack, really poignant, I mean, it's, it makes you shiver, um, has been told in English by a German migrant to the States. So these, very typical for a, a country with many migrants, is, is you've got these shifting, um, shifting identities. You have to answer here because uh, Rob is recording. A very short, this is an interesting question, and especially New York is very interesting, I think, because you had there a community of 300,000 German uh, people with German origins. And um, yeah, that's part of the research for this project as well, that we hope we are we will be able to dig up some interesting personal stories to to show the the nuance and the the, the several identities and, yeah. and uh, in this project and in this uh, in this history so and uh, we'll we'll integrate that in the book definitely yeah. Yeah. and and motivations as well are very interesting because i was just uh, thinking of of also an american who died as a canadian soldier and who's buried in flanders and on his headstone it says um, he crossed the border, he joined up to avenge the Lusitania murder. So you really got the motivation is mentioned on, on the headstone. Yeah. Sorry, I was... Uh, Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, a difficult question. Uh, you can analyze all the propaganda, but uh, it's more difficult to analyze um, its impact. Yeah, that's much more difficult. Um, the Lusitania case is a good example, but of course that's propaganda based on facts. 
And what you generally can see is that even if many Americans wanted to stay out of the war, there clearly was sympathy for, for instance, Belgium. That's why in the beginning I made a comparison with Ukraine today, because what you have is an independent country, um, a, a quite a peaceful country at that. Uh, not that we was nothing to, I mean, there was the Congo and all that, but um, but basically a peaceful country, an independent sovereign country, which was invaded by a mighty neighbor. Um, and so that created immediately a lot of sympathy. Um, some of the sympathy is directed towards aid, um, and some of the sympathy is directed towards yeah, physical well, joining the armies. Um, but that's the most motivated ones before uh, 1917. But um, uh, measuring the impact of propaganda is, even if you make an analysis of the press, that is just an analysis of the press. It does not tell you how people who read that press uh, feel about it. So it's an extremely difficult uh, process. You should go through many letters and diaries to gouge, um, gouge that impact. We don't have the time to do that, unfortunately. Uh, just on, on, regarding Lusitania, I mean, and the US finally entering to war, one of the first well, reactions was of, of uh, Winston Churchill, and I have his quote here. Uh, so the, the US decision to enter the war at such a late stage was not only accepted with gratitude by the Allies, because you have this Churchill who declared in the House of Commons, of course, it wouldn't be Churchill. What he did in April 1917 could have been done in May 1915 after the sinking of the Lusitania. And if it if done then, what abridgment of the slaughter, what sparing of the agony, what ruin, what catastrophes would have been prevented? In how many millions of homes would an empty chair be occupied today? But that's that's yeah, it's counterfactual, counterfactual, yeah. and politics, of course. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dominic, Peter, thank you so much. And uh, one of one of the traditions that we have here at Tudor Place for anyone who comes here from overseas, um, international travelers, we give them a very large, heavy book that they <laughs> will have to pack and, and take back. But no, I'm, I'm pleased to share with you for, for your museum, our book, Tudor Place, America's Story Lives Here, which is something we did for our bicentennial, which was, gosh, six years ago now, uh, but a, a, a beautiful presentation of, uh, of our Thanks to, to both of you for sharing your, your stories with us. Um, one quick question. Can we go to your website and keep track of this, uh, keep track of this project? Yeah. Is that? Um, the museum's website is quite simple. It's www.inflandersfields, in um, um, plural, dot be. And normally um, the project is mentioned on the website and um, the follow-up and each event linked to the project will be announced on the website uh, between now and 2024, basically. Yeah. Terrific. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you again so much. Thank you all of you for joining us. Thank you those who are, are joining us uh, remotely. Um, I do want to invite everyone back a week from today, the final program of our 2022 lecture series. Dr. Uh, Melanie Keichel is an associate professor, professor of history at Virginia Tech, and she's gonna make a presentation, A Whiff of Illness, Fighting Stench and Protecting Health in 19th Century Washington, D.C. So our lecture series really has been about what are, what are the sensations of, of place. Last month, we talked about the sounds, the historic sounds in Washington, D.C. And uh, next week on the 8th at 6.30 right here, uh, we'll be talking about the smells of, of the city. So 
Hope that you will join us for that. And again, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you.